Uh, thank you everyone for coming and attending our presentation, our presentations, and a big thank you to the PhD Engineering Summit for giving us this opportunity to speak about our research in front of you all. Uh, my name is Saptik Barwa. I'm a PhD student at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Um, I've also worked with the MD Anderson Cancer Center and the University of Michigan during my PhD. Today, I'm gonna to talk about how I have tried to show that capturing different kinds of structure in cancer imaging data can help us to predict for clinical outcomes of interest. And this can then assist clinicians or doctors to design more effective, more optimal, personalized treatments. Okay, so quick show of hands. Who knows who this person is? Anyone? Okay, so this is Dr. Jim Allison, who won the Nobel Prize this year in medicine for his work, pioneering work in immunotherapy. And it so happens that Dr. Allison works across the street at MD Anderson in Houston as well. Um, slightly harder one, who knows who this person is? Yeah. Yeah, so this is former US President uh, Jimmy Carter, who actually is one of the most high profile names to have had successful treatment using immunotherapy. Um, and so what we are seeing in the last few years is immunotherapy is this treatment uh, regimen that activates the body's own immune system to fight cancer better. And this has been shown to be very promising in very advanced cancers as well. But for every success story like President Carter or this girl Emily over here, we have many other patients who do not uh, benefit from immunotherapy. Um, so the challenge, the need of the hour is to figure out why immunotherapy does not work for every, uh, every patient and what should be the optimal immunotherapy regimen for these different patients. Thus, there is a need for personalized immunotherapy. Okay, moving gears to another kind of treatment that has been there for decades is radiation treatments. Especially it's used a lot in head and neck cancers. Uh, however, even for these patients, they develop long-term radiation side effects like dry mouth or xerostomia or bone death uh, or osteoradionecrosis. So can we also figure out which patients are at a greater risk of developing these radiation-induced injuries much in advance so that we can take corrective action? And so we also think there is a need for personalized radiotherapy treatments. So in order to facilitate our goal of personalized treatment, I have uh, approached this from a data-driven uh, side of things, a very conventional data-driven model here, but specifically using image data is what I use. And we build a model that captures specific kinds of structure that's present in these imaging data that helps us, excuse me, to predict for a clinical outcome of interest. And thus, this can help clinicians design treatments better, okay? Um, I'm going to talk about two specific image data sets that I've worked with. The one on the right is more common. It's uh, CT scans from radiology. And the one on the left is a newer sort of imaging modality for tissues called multiplexed immunofluorescence imaging. Um, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus mostly on the first part here, which is I extract spatial structure in these tissue images that captures the spatial distributions of cancer cells and immune cells. And this uh, we're going to show can help clinicians to determine better immunotherapy treatments. I'm going to briefly give an overview of my work in extracting temporal structure in CT scans acquired over time that can help us predict in advance uh, about radiation injuries uh, in patients. Okay, so let's get to it. Um, in this part, what I'm going to talk about is how we take as input a multiplexed immunofluorescent image like this we extract the spatial structure in terms of the distributions of the different kinds of cells, and we show that this can actually help us in understanding or being able to estimate which patients will survive longer uh, in their immune contexture, but also figuring out which patients' tumors are at a greater risk of escalating to a higher grade ones. So these are the kind of uh, questions that I have answered in my thesis work. Okay, what's multiplex immunofluorescence imaging? A quick overview. Um, so what you see here is a tumor that has been biopsied from a patient. You slice up the tumor, uh, and then what you do is you stain it with fluorophores. Different fluorophores tag on to different kinds of cells uh, within uh, a slice. 
uh, and from the spectral signature of these of this uh, of the slide, uh, you do some image segment, some cell segmentation, some cell detection. What you end up with is something like this. Uh, the dots here indicate a different the, uh, the nuclei of different cell types. The color indicates what kind of cell it is. So you have in cyan the cancer cells, uh, in yellow the killer T cells, so on and so forth. And this is a 600 micron by 500 micron snip of a tissue. Okay, so this is how the images look like. Once we have this, this is where my contributions kick in. Uh, given that we know the spatial locations and the type of cells that we have, we want to quantify uh, the distributions of different cell types, specifically how infiltrating the immune cells are into the cancer cells. Here I'm showing three specific patients. Okay, So as you can see, these three patients have very different levels of infiltration. I'm just showing two of the eight cells that you saw here. I'm just showing only two cells, two types of cells here. The green ones are the cancer cells, and the red ones are the immune cells. Okay, and we want to be able to quantify the infiltration levels of uh, the immune cells in these three patients. Okay, now I'm going to talk about two methods that have been tried before, and then our proposed method, and we're going to evaluate the three methods on these three criteria. I'm going to talk about what these three criteria are in a bit. The fact that immune infiltration is important uh, was actually started by the work from scientist Jerome Galland, who developed the immunoscore uh, algorithm, which is, uh, in the previous slide, for example, would simply be the counts or the densities of different immune cell types. And they showed that the this count and density metric actually is prognostic of how fast disease re reoccurs in colorectal cancer patients. Um, now let's see how well this method does on the three criterion. In terms of infiltration, I call this moderate because uh, while, of course, more cells, immune cells you have, greater is the chance of infiltration. However, uh, that does not necessarily, a higher cell count, as you can see here, does not necessarily mean greater infiltration. Here, the red cells are roughly same in number, but you can clearly see a difference in the infiltration levels, correct? Um, Counts, the counts method does not in, uh, uh, know about the proximities of the different cells. It just counts the overall number of cells, but does not take into account how far or close the different cell types are from each other, uh, which we think is important. And spatial resolution, I'm saying, is how much can you disturb the configuration of cells but still get the same answer, right? So for counts, you can like move around the green cells and the red cells, but the count remains the same. So the resolution of this method is only on the whole slide level. Make sense? The next big advance came in 2015 by the work of Marco Melli, who uh, used ideas from ecology called the Morisita Horn Index to quantify infiltration. What you do here is you just split up your whole slide into smaller grids and measure the mixing levels of different cells within these smaller grids. That's why the one on the left here, you can see that none of the smaller grids have both a blue and a green cell, and so the index is zero, whereas here there is greater mixing, and a the more the mixing is, the higher the value of this metric. Okay, um, let's see how this, how well this method does. Infiltration, yes, it does uh, very well, do a good job of measuring how mixed the cells are. However, in terms of spatial proximities, you can move around any green cell within the square, and that would not affect the result. So it does not take into account spatial proximities at distances that are smaller than the square grid uh, distances, okay? And thus, the spatial resolution is also in the order of the square dimensions that have been chosen here. Now, what I will try to convince you over the next few minutes is that uh, we have come up with a method that hopefully improves upon the existing methods in all these three criteria, which we call as the spatial G function, okay? Um, the spatial G function has its roots in, uh, also in ecology, and what we saw that this function is used to model predator and prey interactions in ecology. So predators like lions with prey like deer, rabbits, or even predators like deers with prey like uh, grass, for example. And so we thought, hey, why not think of cancer cells as the prey and immune cells as the predators and uh, reformulate, restructure those ideas from ecology for the uh, immunotherapy uh, signs of uh, side of things, okay? Uh, just to give you a taste of basically what this algorithm is about, uh, think in terms of these blue cells, what fractions of these blue cells have a red cell around them at different distances are, okay? 
so you can see uh, for this one, what will happen is the fractions will increase in steps of one third as you go at along these distances. Whereas for this situation here, uh, all these three blue cells will see a red cell only if you go to 20 microns. And so this curve will jump from zero to one like this. And this sort of gives you a taste, right? Because on the left and the right, you both have the same number of uh, cancer cells, the same number of immune cells. However, the spatial infiltration pattern is pretty different. And this sort of curve somehow captures the signature of infiltration in these two cases. And uh, this is what the G function is. Uh, very simply put, it is similar to the nearest neighbor distribution function, where we try to figure out what fraction of cells of type I, which could be the blue cells here, has a cell of type yellow around it. Okay, uh, This is a very basic structure. There are more mathematical details that I'm not going to go into for the sake of time, where we correct for issues like boundary effects and edge criterion. So to very simply put, what fractions of blue cells have a yellow cell at a distance R around it? Uh, okay, now let's get back to the three patient scenario. What I've shown here is uh, actually for uh, one of our data sets that we have, we had 132 patients, and we plot the G functions for all those 132 patients. And I specifically highlighted these three patients here. The green one is the patient who had the highest infiltration, the red one is the one with medium, and the yellow one is the one with the low infiltration. So what you can see here are two things. First, the G function seems to respect what you see visually in terms of infiltration levels. So the green one is the curve that rises very fast, whereas the yellow one is the one that rises very slow. Okay, and this also gives, the second thing is, it also gives you an idea of now doctors can start thinking of patients in terms of these signatures. So this could be the immune fingerprint of different patients. And now doctors can talk in terms of, hey, this patient is a patient like this versus a patient like this. Okay, so this is what we envisage can happen in the future. One more cool thing about this, uh, the G-function approach is, uh, as one of the questions came in a little while back, that sometimes you want to not only interrogate cancer cell and a specific kind of immune cell, but you also want to interrogate how well an immune cell behaves in the presence of a different kind of immune cell. So for example, in lung cancer, we saw that the killer T cells effect is actually mitigated by the presence of the suppressive T regulatory cells. And that's something we can also uh, capture using the G-function. Uh, okay, let's go to some results. Um, the first thing we did was uh, we looked at data from pancreatic cancer patients who were uh, interrogated at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Um, this has a very poor survival outcome typically. Um, and so what we wanted to see is can our G function, can metrics derived from our G function be able to uh, give a risk of which patients will survive longer uh, versus uh, not? in the presence of known clinical predictors that already exist. Okay? And we wanted to build a model that uh, ties uh, our metric uh, versus other, other predictors in predicting uh, how long these patients will survive. Okay? Um, first off, we didn't want to use the whole G function. That's a like lot of points in the function. right? So first, we wanted to come up with one number. Like age is one number, right? like 50 years old. Sex is one value, like male or female. So what we wanted to come up with is, can we find one number that summarizes the G function? And the most natural way to do it was just to compute the area under the curve. Uh, in this case, we looked at the area from 0 to 20 microns, because that's what our clinical collaborators felt was an interesting distance to look at in terms of cell-to-cell -cell contact, that distance indicates. And so we computed the area under the curve of these G functions for the patients. And what we found is that, again, I don't have hard numbers here. We are welcome to refer to our paper. Uh, that came out um, uh, in 2017, where we actually showed that the spatial proximities of cancer cells and cytotoxic T cells as captured by our G function is an independent predictor of overall survival in patients. Uh, the ones who have a greater amount of cytotoxic T cell infiltration tended to do uh, survive much longer compared to, uh, unfortunately, the ones who had lower cytotoxic T cell infiltration. So this was an interesting finding. Uh, for us in terms of using our spatial uh, metric. Uh, and one uh, cool thing that recently came up is I went back to search our paper recently, and uh, now because on this paper we work with Dr. Allison, it now has this cool uh, label beside it. Well, at least in terms of Euclidean distance, I feel this is the closest I will come to a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. So at least that's a nice thing that came up. Yeah. Um, and there are issues with the G function. 
uh, primarily the need to set this distance r, the fact that the shape of the G function is not incorporated, and what happens when the different spatial interactions are actually very correlated, okay? This was not the case in the previous one, but it became apparent in our next uh, set of analysis. So imagine if you were to interact the interactions between these two cell types. However, this one is a subset of this, and so these interactions tend to be have very similar G functions. Can we do better than the one AUC metric? Can we capture the shape of the curve efficiently? And also, can we explain multiple correlated features? And this was our second contribution, is we used something called as the MFPCA algorithm to the people who have uh, worked with data science in the audience. PCA is the familiar principal component analysis. Functional PCA is PCA that's geared for structured functional data, like the G function is a function of distance. And so given N patients, P spatial interactions, and T distance units uh, as the data, uh, this algorithm proceeds in two steps. Again, I won't go into the mathematical details, but the first step is a univariate functional PCA, which is responsible for capturing the shape of the curve. And the second step is a multivariate step, which incorporates or handles the correlations between different features. Okay, so overall, this metric gives us a very compact representation, not one number, but a few numbers to represent each patient, but still way more compact uh, given the number of spatial interactions and distance points involved. Okay, so this we used in predicting the risk of progression in a different kind of pancreatic cancer called IPMNs, which has a good prognosis if you have a low-grade version of it, but can escalate to PDAC, which, as you saw, has a very poor prognosis. And turns out that uh, using the spatial distributions of different cells, uh, using the MFPCA method, combined with the counts method, so there's value in both combining these methods, we could actually predict the grade of the IPMN. This is fine, this is one step that even a pathologist can do, but what was even cooler was that we could actually predict which patients were at a greater risk of progressing to the higher uh, grade of IPMN. Uh, excuse the term G cross here, we were like still figuring out whether to call, this was the old name of our method, uh, but yeah, G cross essentially means G function. And again, we found that a combination of a counts based model with the functional analysis, uh, functional PCA kind of metric, helps us to predict which low grade IPMN patients are at a greater risk of progressing to a higher grade of uh, cancer, okay? And this, uh, the method that we used also lets us figure out uh, which spatial interactions are the key ones. And then this can help the clinicians to understand better and to look at these uh, cellular interactions more closely. So we also contribute, we hope, towards better cancer biology understanding. Um, and so yeah, so this is what we discovered. Again, I encourage you to read our paper for greater details. Um, <laughs> In the interest of time, I won't go too much into detail of what we have done with the temporal structure, but essentially, we have CT scans acquired over uh, multiple time points, and we want to be able to predict very early on something that happens two years down the line, okay? Uh, and we have, this is a, an ongoing work, we have lesser data points here, but we have uh, CT scans acquired at these different three different time points, and we, what we want to predict is ORN at 1.5 years into the future, um, the previous approaches that have been used only use either the CT scans information before radi radiotherapy treatment or a simple difference, meaning how much it changed from this time to this point and so on. But what we want to do is FPC again, this time applying it for temporal functions or temporal uh, data. And we want to find out the signatures in time that help us understand how the disease is going to progress. And these signatures, essentially what you see here is the principal components, and for these patients, which principal components are contributing, and this is the signature now for different patients. And we, this is very preliminary work, we have not made any conclusions about this yet, but we find that our method that exploits temporal structure does seem to be able to predict for which patients are at a greater risk of developing bone death. Um, just to summarize, what I have done is can we exploit the structure, different kinds of structure in cancer imaging data, such as tissue, micro, multiplex immunofluorescence imaging, or CT scans acquired over time? That can help us to predict for clinical outcomes of interest, like, like survival or risk of bone death. And this, we hope, this information, we hope, can help clinicians design better personalized treatments, but also this can help us understand the biology behind cancers better. Um, I want to acknowledge Oh, before I acknowledge people, I want to also say what I want to do in the future. I, 
I'm very, um, I am really, uh, you know, tied to this problem of understanding children's health uh, problems better. So I want to translate the work that I've done to understand children's uh, health diseases better using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And yeah, finally, I acknowledge my advisor, Dr. Arvind Rao, my co-advisor, Dr. Shapira Raghavan, my PhD committee and my collaborators, uh, my friends, and my guitar is also my friend because without this, I wouldn't have made it through my PhD. So thank you for listening, and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Subtik. Any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. <laughs> Yes, Ali. How do you compute the G function? How yeah, so, so the G function is very simply related to the nearest neighbor distribution function. OK, so what you do here is you have these different cell types, right? Now you choose a reference cell category. Let's say we want to calculate the infiltration of immune cells into cancer cells. And so you were trying to estimate what is the fraction of the cancer cells that have an immune cell at a distance r from it. So you go start at a cancer cell, go to a distance r, and look around. So you scan it. Yeah, so you, lo you look a radial scan at a distance r. And you compute this for every value r, and that's how you get the g function. It's a what fraction of cancer cells. So it's one third, one third, one third, as you go in this direction. Does that make sense? So visually, a person can look at that image, yeah. and they will arrive at the same conclusion that you will arrive at from the algorithm. Yeah, so the issue, so, yeah. So how is the algorithm helping the individual? Right, so this I did not uh, give an overview of, but if you give the same slides to a pathologist, they will look at different aspects of this uh, slide and make their conclusions. Like the immunoscore, for example, different pathologists could mark out different areas in this slide and count those sets. So it has inter-pathologist as well as sometimes intra-pathologist variability. The same pathologist will make different calls of what region to look at immune infiltration. Uh, and so what we provide is a robust, quantitative, and uh, consistent way of finding out this metric. And also the hope is instead of subjective words like high and medium, doctors can now talk in terms of hard numbers. So what they can do is they can say, oh, this patient is an AUC of two. And this would mean the same thing no matter which doctor in the world is looking at the slide. So that's the hope we have for this G-function method to improve upon subjective measures like this. Yes, please. You were, sorry. Thank you for this very nice talk. You, you were mentioning that it would be nice to have another metrics for this G of R instead of just having the, the area under the curve. Yes, yes. I mean, this to me looks very much like this probabilistic uh, functions, like viable distribution. Yeah. Did you try to look at it in terms of trying to fit some uh, you know, model or curve to this and then use the slope and the, you know, the different patterns in the curve that would always be the same in these distribution functions and then map these. For example, the slope would be, uh, you know, how fast it grows and then whatever. Yeah. The so, yeah, so there, are, there could be multiple things that we could do and this multivariate FPC is one step in that direction. So, like I said, the first part, the, uni the first step of the FPC algorithm captures the shape. Okay, so it's instead of saying that, okay, we know that this curve will always increase, right? It's a probability distribution, it will always increase. So can we utilize that information somehow? And the univariate FPC step does do that. It captures the fact that it's always going to increase. And so, yeah, so we can definitely try some of the other methods that are there in the literature. But as a first pass, we wanted to see something that does both the shape part as well as ex removing the correlations amongst various spatial interactions part as well. Thank you for your question. We have time for one more. Uh, thanks again. Um, uh, maybe a naive question is, yeah. w would it be worth going to 3D if you have multiple slices and look at distribution in 3D? Would you have even more information or you think it's not needed? So for the remaining three months of my PhD, I'm actually working on a 3D uh, problem where essentially what we do is, like you rightly said, we can get more information if instead of just using uh, just this one slice, we actually now have data from multiple slices, and we are now trying to integrate the spatial distributions across these different slices. So that's the 3D angle we are going for. So yes, we are looking at 3D as well. Thank you so much for Great. your question. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Subtik. Thank Let's you. Let's thank you once more for your talk.